punching him, striking him, trying to kill him as he plays. If she was on the ground, down low, with her left hand, trying to cover her face. It doesn't add up. It simply does not make sense. In addition to that, I will point to the sequence of events itself. Now, we all heard of standard ground law, and there's no duty to retreat, and we're all very familiar with that concept. But here's the thing, Your Honor. According to both the defendant's statement and the surveillance video, he did retreat. He retreated. He said that he was being punched by his wife in the kitchen. Fine. We don't contest that there was an argument between Jennifer and the defendant that morning. We don't contest that. Isabel confirms that. She heard it. It was a loud argument. That's not a dispute. The question is, assuming the defendant was correct, assuming she was punching him in the kitchen, what did he then do? He retreated. He fled. He left. And the video clearly shows that she did not pursue him. She wasn't chasing him. She wasn't continuing to punch him. She wasn't continuing to attack him, even if she ever was. So what that clearly shows is that from the moment Dara Medina went upstairs and Jennifer Alfonso remained downstairs, the fight, if there was one, was over. It was done. There was no more dispute. There was no reason to grab a gun and bring it back downstairs. When he did that, he became the aggressor. He became the initiator. He lost any right to claim a self-defense. He was within his rights to go upstairs, call 911, and tell the police my wife is hitting on me. That was his right. He had absolutely no right to grab a gun and reintroduce a deadly weapon into the equation. And we submit that under the jury instruction, it specifically says in the justifiable use of self uh, deadly force that the defendant cannot reinitiate contact with the victim. If the fight or the dispute is over and the victim has stopped her attack or his attack, the defendant cannot then reapproach the victim and restart the aggression and claim self-defense. And yet that's what he did. So although he may not have had a duty to retreat under the law, he did retreat. And having retreated, he forfeited any right that he had to claim self-defense in this case. <clears throat> um, so it, it's the state's position, Your Honor. The, the physical evidence is absolutely indisputable. It's irrefutable. It's clear. Uh, this was this was an execution, is what it was. Mr. Medina executed his wife because she said she was going to leave him. And that's exactly what he told Gabriel Vieira he would do if his wife ever left him or cheated on him. He would kill her. Well, Your Honor, she said, I'm going to leave you, and he carried out his threats. He did what he said he was going to do. Uh, this was murder. Anyway, he sliced it. It was murder. It was not self-defense. And we have to find the evidence in the There's a flip side to that coin, Judge. What the defense is going to ask you to do is to look at not segments of, an, of that day, but to look at that entire day. To look at not only that entire day, but look at the relationship that Derek had with the team in this case. And it's important to do that. Because it culminates into what was going on in Derek's mind on that day. So let me start off with telling you what our position is in terms of what happened that day, and then we'll proceed at that day. It's uncontroverted that the deceit in this case wanted Derek to wake her up at 1.30 in the morning to watch movies either with herself or with her kid or whatever it was. And he didn't do it. And from 1.30 in the morning till she won't come up at 9.30 for eight hours, she stewed in her own bed. And that's evident by the text messages that she had between herself and her friend. Peppered throughout those text messages are not only her discontent with her relationship with Derek, but there's she specifically states she wanted to, to cause harm to Derek. She wanted to rip his face off. 
These are her words, not mine. That day, from 1.30 in the morning till 9.30, if you read the text messages of Judge when you review the surveillance, you'll see the scene in this case from 1.30 in the morning coming up and down the stairs in that apartment. 18 times. She changes clothes three times. She states in her text message that she's got to take a shower to calm down. She's so agitated by his not waking up at 1.30 to watch a movie that she needs to take steps to calm herself down. She needs to talk to her friends to calm herself down. What does that suggest and what does that indicate? That indicates she's angry at Derek. And you know what? Don't take my word for it. If Isabella in the minor victim statement the child buttresses our position. That it's the deceit in this case that approaches Derek, starts arguing with him. The child's words in this case are that Derek tried to calm her down. He was attempting to facilitate what was appropriate in this case, calm down your overreacting, but it didn't work. And her level of anger and, and, and distress and stewing at her own bedroom, it didn't get better, it got worse. And it went from her yelling at Derek, loud enough that the child could hear, to her throwing things out. The detective tried to minimize towels in the scare, but that's not all that Derek said. When you read his statement, look at what he says. The detective goes from trying to just kind of give you uh, two statements, two items, which kind of were loud. Mascara and towel, it's, those are dangerous weapons. But if you have shoes, boxes, whatever she could get her hands on, that to me, she's taking the next step. She maintained her position as the aggressor in this case. She physically and psychologically assaulted Derek that morning, and that's buttressed by her own daughter's testimony. Her own daughter, who, at, when she was giving the statement, didn't realize or didn't have a position, clearly her position would be in furtherance of a testimony towards her mother, but her daughter told the truth. And the truth was that Derek tried to calm her down and it didn't work. Her level of aggression went from verbal abuse to physical abuse. And that's a huge jump. And then when she goes downstairs and she separates herself from Derek, and Derek goes to... Actually, well, let's back up. If you read his his sworn testimony, the reason why she stopped throwing things at him and assaulting him was because he claims he produced a firearm. And even when he produced a firearm upstairs, and you know it's unfortunate that that surveillance video, we don't have access to it, or the government wasn't able to produce it. We're going to have our own experts look at it. But he, his testimony is, I put the gun on her upstairs after she was throwing things at me to make her stop. And that's what made her stop. But if you read his testimony, he says she laughs at him. You're not going to shoot me. She didn't take his position seriously. She laughed at him and she continued assaulting. And then when she goes downstairs, if you look at the security surveillance, the first time my client goes downstairs, you can clearly see the decedent strike him in the face. That's when he decides to go back upstairs. Because the last time he was physically assaulted, the only thing that stopped the decedent in that case was the presentation of a firearm. And that's what he did. He got, he got his firearm to, to, to use that to thwart for further physical assaults. And when he goes downstairs, whether she had the knife or she didn't have the knife, the government here wants to minimize what happened. There was a struggle over the knife, and Derek disarmed her. And after taking away the knife and producing a firearm, she still came out. Now, the government provided an autopsy report, which we just got last Thursday. We solicited the, uh, the, the, uh, the advice of an expert, Dr. Michael Knighton, to be our forensic examiner. And he's going to be able to rebut the government's position. Obviously, we haven't had the time to be able to do that in his position, but that's one person's opinion. And the court understands that. The court understands the blood spatter evidence is one person's opinion. It can be rebutted and it can be refuted. And unfortunately, because those people weren't presented, we weren't able to cross-examine them. So the validity of those, of, of those reports has to be taken under the position that this is something geared toward the government's prosecution. Now, let's look at the history that transpired between my client and 
the decedent in this case. You have her diary, which clearly shows her internal thoughts. She classifies the diary in a very unusual way. The mind of an insane woman. And throughout this, and obviously the courts had an opportunity to review this, she talks about the apocalypse and the zombie and other things which are part of the mental psyche. But she also talks about hurting Derek. When the government did their investigation, Detective Wilson had an opportunity to interview people that were associated or that knew her very well. Bruce Bates was one of those people. I mean, five days a week, he went to Denny's and he knew Jennifer on a very personal level. He had information regarding their relationship that I don't think many people would have. He liked Jennifer. He didn't necessarily like Derek, but he was honest. And what did he tell the detective? And what did he tell our investigator? She was the one that abused my client. She was the man. He was the woman. She admitted to being the abuser, not the abusee. And that resonated in her own words, in her diary, in the text messages that she has. And if you look at what happened on that day, you'll see the aggressor is consistently the deceiver in this case. Now, the government stated the standard ground law, but I'd also ask the court, and I was coming over my phone earlier because I was looking at the case, the Castle Doctrine applies to co-occupants. To, to co and the court will look at the Wyoming versus State, which is 732 Southern 2nd, 1044. The Castle Doctrine is applicable in this case. And that states that in addition to whatever the standard ground law states, that he has no duty to, re to retreat in his, own, in his own home, that he can meet force with force of him, including to death force. It's very similar to the standard ground law. But that defense is also applicable in this case. Garrett was put in a position that minutes before this incident happened, he, based on the words of Isabella Vieira, was attempting to resolve this situation. You don't go from zero to 60 for no reason. You don't go from trying to calm somebody down to killing somebody for no reason. Derek was defending himself. This, the deceased's actions in this case her text messages, her internal thoughts, as well as the view on the camera the first time that Derek's with her clearly shows she's the aggressor, she's assaulting Mr. Mitty. And then obviously, everything that transpired afterwards, Derek went upstairs, uh, and I know I'm just supposed to address the, the non honorable issue here. I'll reserve my additional uh, arguments for for part two regarding this of flight and danger to the community, unless we're going to make it now. Uh, no, we'll stick to phase one at this time. So I think that we've, pro we've provided the guidelines and the basis for work. the defense that we have in this case. I think self-defense is relevant. I think that the violent spousal syndrome is relevant in this case. I don't think it only applies to women. I think that it, it's gender bias, and based on the evidence that we provided, that's something the court should take into consideration, along with the Castle Doctrine and the standard ground defense. They're all applicable in this case, and we believe the government has not met the high, high standard of proof evidence for such a case. Thank you. Say any final words? Uh, for those in the courtroom, um, we have some students in court today. Uh, this is a bond hearing. This is not a determination by the court of guilt or innocence. This is simply a determination, uh, the first step in the deter court's determination of whether bond is appropriate in this case. And as to phase one of uh, an Arthur hearing based upon a uh, previous court case that sets forth the standard, the court must make a determination of whether or not the state has proven uh, proof evident presumption great. That is the standard of proof in these type of hearings. If the court deems that proof evident presumption great has been found, then the defense can request of the court to use its discretion to set a bond in a phase two. If the court does not find proof evident presumption great, then a bond uh, will be granted. <clears throat> After a review of the evidence in this case, having heard the testimony as presented by the party today, the court is going to make a finding of proof evident presumption great. Um, based upon the evidence that was presented, uh, Mr. Medina did leave the area where the incident occurred and re-engaged, and the court um, at this time 
based upon the case law beliefs of the state of Minnesota. So with that being said, does the uh, defense have any witnesses or any uh, argument in, in furtherance of phase two? Yes, Judge, the defense will be calling uh, Father Frank Horvison. Thank you, Mr. Objection, Your Honor. Ms. Carter, I'm sorry, just a moment. Oh, 
Okay, but say the first part of the sentence again, please. You said you don't believe that he would have he would violate the laws if given a bond, correct? Prior to being informed of what has occurred in this case, would you have ever believed that this defendant would have shot at his wife eight times while she was cowering?
quite a bit against the what he's told me um, <coughs> that his grandmother was uh, not being properly taken care of and uh, when he found out uh, he actually uh, got involved um, realized that uh, she was not being fed properly she was being you know embezzled funds and uh, <coughs> he did call the uh, I believe uh, he uh, called, uh, I, I think she was reported to the police also in this matter. Okay, and, she was, uh, she was, it was more than just not being taken care of, correct? She was being denied food by her parents. She was being denied food and pampered. And, uh, uh, pampers, pampers. and who was the person that made the determination that she was uh, being denied uh, food and pampers? There. There. And the question is, did Derek take Madison to his own hands? Did he go to confront the caretaker or did he uh, report it to the appropriate authority? He, he reported it to the appropriate authority and at one point, uh, because the caretaker was living there, he allowed them to stay there and he took his grandmother over to his place for her to temporarily stay there. Okay. If Derek is ready to bond that he where would he stay? He would be staying with me. Okay, who lives in your house? My father and my wife. Okay, and how old is your father? My father is 89 years old. And how big is your house? It's a four bedroom, three bath, and 2,500 square feet. You have a landline? Do I have a landline? Yes, I do. Okay. Are there any convicted felons living in your house? No. If Derek were to be granted a bond, do you believe that he would abide by the conditions of the court? Absolutely. Would he drink? No, he just said he was never really drank uh, in front of me and he's very drank very little all his When I mean drink, I mean alcohol. He wouldn't yes, drink. that's what I, I understood. And uh, would he be taking drugs? No, absolutely not. Has Derek ever lived, to your knowledge, outside the United States? Has he ever lived? He lived outside the United States. No. Do you believe he would be a flight risk? Abs no, I don't think so. Not absolutely, yeah. Okay. Are there firearms in your house? They are, I have a concealed weapon permit. Okay. But I don't have any firearms in my house. Okay. Instructed her to stay in the room 
and stay put uh, to try to keep her from letting transpire downstairs. Um, the argument could be made that if he did what he did with the terms with, with regards to the minor was to protect her from what had transpired. Uh, he could have, given the fact that she was a witness to, to this incident, if he was a violent person or if he had violent tendencies, he could have done something as far as his children. And he did the absolute polar opposite. He told her to, to stay put and to stay where she was. He instructed her specifically to stay in her room. And he did that knowing that once he informed law enforcement of what transpired, law enforcement would be going there. And it's very important for the court to take into consideration given what had subsequently transpired with, with, with Mr. Medina. Um, if you look at, regarding the second phase, there's been no evidence suggesting that he had any ties outside of the United States, that he had the ability to travel outside of the United States. Um, this would be the ties are the Atlanta himself, or that his family here. Allegations, no calls, no disturbances. A person in Dade County that had a concealed permit for over eight years with not one incident or blemish to suggest that he would be a flight risk or a danger to the community. Um, someone that's actively involved in the community, he was actively involved in the church. He did volunteer work teaching, teaching kids how to play basketball. That's how to tie into the community. Is there's not many thirty-year-olds that have steady jobs that are also affording themselves and availing themselves to try to better the community. Everybody that he knows is here, and if Derek wanted to attempt to flee or if he didn't have time in the community. He could have easily did what, what, what transpired that day and, and left. He could have got, gotten his car and dro dro driven to an airport and gone to Venezuela. There's no extradition. He could have you know, just started driving and got back to the airport and left the country. He could have done he had the option to do many things and what he did and what he chose to do was to turn himself in to the police almost immediately after this case, this case occurred. He also called his employer, as was elicited by the government, and told him what happened. He said, listen, this is what, what, what I'm going to come to the work next, I'm turning myself in. He always had the mindset prior to going to his parents' house that he was going to turn himself in. Uh, the testimony that's been elicited by his family members are that he stayed his father's house. Uh, if the court wants to put him on 24-hour uh, community control of the monitor, uh, he'd surrender his passport. The court would be able to avail themselves to his location at, 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 at all times. This is a house where there's no alcohol, there's no drugs, there's no firearms. Um, and he would be able to uh, assist, obviously, the feds that would be able to, to have him uh, not in custody and, and afford us the opportunity to, to be able to defend him while he's not even in, in the part of the question. Obviously, I stated at the beginning, prior to the hearing, that we were running on some, some snap moves, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all those, but I haven't listed what they are. And there have been additional medical issues that he's had, which haven't been, in our eyes, adequately treated in the Department of Corrections. Uh, this is something that would be an issue if he was given a bond and afforded to, uh, to stay in his father's home, as to the home that he was raised in. Um, with regards to the danger of the community, Judge, I would say, uh, unfortunately, the only player, this is the thing, if there's a, if, presumably, if there was a rebuttable presumption of danger, hypothetically speaking, uh, we believe that we'd be able to rebut that because the only person that was ever dangerous towards Derek or that Derek was dangerous towards was his wife, was the deceased. She's no longer, she's, she's deceased. There has been no testimony that Mr. Uh, Medina the Derek has ever had violent confrontations with anybody else. I think the, I think the government's been reaching when they bought in after Ruiz five years ago that he called having a three-minute sparring session with Mr. Medina. And to me, I, I don't think that, that shows the indication of being violent at all. It's just working out. What would show that he was violent is that he was a member, he was a member of the neighborhood watch. He was armed during that time with a legal permit. No point were there any allegations that he pulled the George Zimmerman to try to take law into his own hand, that he had this uh, arrogance or violence or, or that, that, that type of demeanor. It's not the case. If there are any cases, that, and this is came from Detective uh, Grossman, Mr. Medina called the police. He did what he was supposed to do. Uh, when there was any disturbances on the non-emergency line, he called the police. When he was working with the neighborhood watchman, he called the police. 
when he found out his own grandmother was being denied food and being abused, he called the police. He could have easily gone the other route. He could have easily been someone that says, you know what, I'm a tough guy, I've got a gun, I'm going to impose my will. He didn't do that. I think that's a reflection of who he is, but for this incident, I think this incident is a vacuum. I think it's a, an anomaly. I don't think that Mr. Medina is a dangerous person, but for what it transpired in this case, I think the culmination of what happened between him and his wife, like I said, is an anomaly. It's not an accurate reflection of the type of person that Derek is. I think the evidence shows that he's had the opportunities throughout his 30 year life here in Miami-Dade County to be a dangerous person and diverted every opportunity and know what he's supposed to do the right way. Um, he's, uh, he's somebody that the court allows us to post a bond, um, whatever conditions the court deems to be appropriate to substantiate or make the court feel comfortable, we avail ourselves to, like I said, a monitor, any kind of monitoring system, a reporting system, surrendering it. Uh, passport. I know there's been no allegations of drug or alcohol abuse, but he'll submit to random testing. I think there is something the court can construe that would make the court feel comfortable that the person that committed a crime would immediately turn himself in would be someone that would abide by that same morality. That person that would come to court whenever the court deemed to be appropriate. Um, I'm not going to make a recommendation as to what the bond will be, but I think that $150,000 corporate surety bond is the appropriate number in this case, given his lack of a criminal history, uh, and given whatever conditions the court deems to be appropriate. I think that's the right he didn't pull the George Zimmerman, and he's right, he actually did something much worse. He has to leave George Zimmerman out of it, I should have said it earlier, but let's leave George Zimmerman and, and Trayvon Martin out of this I case. I have no place in, in, this, in this case. And I, I am in no way suggesting that he does, but I take issue with the, with the fact that he says that. Because in this case, the defendant has taken a gun to an unarmed person while he has no injuries to himself. But counsel makes, makes a repeated argument that he's not a flight risk and he self-surrendered. Um, and if you want to take the defendant's statement and, and believe that to be true, that he surrendered, um, that's fine. And the fact that he did it then, I think if you look at the evidence, it shows something. And if you look at the evidence, the defendant in this case is a very smart man. He believed he could trick the detectives. He believed he could trick everybody into believing that this was self-defense. At the time he allegedly surrendered himself, he believed that what he was saying was that again his own heart. Okay. Now he has that before your honor and he has listened to the evidence in this case. And what the evidence in this case is, is, it's not about who said or who did what, it's about physical evidence. And as your honor knows, being a trial attorney yourself at one point in time and having presided over many cases, physical evidence is very telling. And in this case, the physical evidence shows that what he said is no longer true. And what the physical evidence shows is that there is proof, evidence, presumption, grapes. Okay? He now knows that. He did not know at the time that he allegedly surrendered. Okay? So now, this defendant has every reason to plead. Why? Because he has now been informed through the procedures that we've had here today that the evidence against him is actually very strong. And actually, the law says that proof, evidence, presumption, great is a higher burden than beyond a reasonable doubt. So what does he know? He knows that there's more than beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence that was presented to the court here today. So I submit to your honor that he has every reason to flee. He is facing a very serious charge, and he is facing evidence that doesn't just go away. Witnesses don't just forget, like you have a testimonial evidence, when a case is based on little testimonial evidence, you have the opportunity that a witness may forget about what happened. In this case, Jennifer Alfonso's body, she's a witness against him. And she is never moving away. Because her body says exactly what he did. He now is on notice of this. And he's on notice that the evidence is strong. So for that reason, I would inform your honor and argue that it's very likely that he would flee because the evidence is that strong. And he now knows it. And he now knows that he can't just trick people into, into saying, oh, this is what happened. Now, that he's not a danger to the community, 
I don't know what the council thinks is the danger of a person who's a danger to the community, but I commit to your honor that somebody who shoots at their loved one that they've been married to for the last four years and unloads eight rounds, not one, eight rounds is a danger to the community. He's a danger to everyone around us. If he loses his temper with anyone on the community, what would stop him from shooting them or from attacking them? When he's already shot somebody he loves, somebody who he, he said he was going to share the rest of his life with and be good to and be true to and, be, and care for. And he did this eight times. Why, why is this a danger to the community? Well, if he really truly was self-defense, he could have shot her once. If he truly was self-defense, he could have called the police right after it happened and say, please come save my wife. I had to shoot her to stop her from killing me, but please save her. Never did any of those things. And again, I take issue with the fact that they're saying he surrendered. Yes, he went to the police station. Yes, his father went with him to the police station, but he fled that scene. He left that 10-year-old little girl to find her dead mother on the floor. And that's what surrender. Surrendering is calling 911 and saying, please help my wife, please come get me, please come speak to me, I have to tell you what happened. That's surrendering. That you leave your ten, the 10-year-old little girl on the floor so she could come downstairs and find the mom in a pool of blood? Judge, I'm going to that that is very hard. No evidence to suggest that happened. The court won't consider that in its ultimate ruling as there was some evidence to that at this hearing. But you may continue. So, as surrender has had for, as Your Honor knows, again, from the experience that Your Honor has had in the courtroom and in the courthouse and in general, it doesn't mean anything to say. Anybody can get a safe passport, anybody can surrender a passport and still flee. GPS monitors get cut off all the time. We see it in this courtroom, we see it in other courtrooms throughout the building. This is a very serious case. It was clear that he knew what he did when he posted that on Facebook for the world to know what he did. He was a smart man. He believed he could get out of it by talking his way out of it. And I, I don't believe, Your Honor, that um, we could sit here and say that he is not a flight risk and that he's not a danger to the community. And that's just one of the things that the rule, that the statute says Your Honor should look. The other factor for the courts to consider is the nature and circumstances of the offense charge. And in this case, Your Honor, it's like a it, It's really bad. The weight of the evidence against the defendant, I think I've already spoken about that, but that's again a factor that this court is to consider. And the nature of the probability of danger the defendant poses to the community. Again, if he wasn't scared to fight a friend, um, and I, I forget his last name right now, a professional in mixed martial arts would say he's not going to fight the next person. When somebody approaches him and says, hey, you, I saw you on the TV. You're the jerk that posted that on Facebook. How is he going to react to that? How is he not going to be, you don't think that he's going to explode on that person? And I believe that for all these reasons, he is a danger to the community. The, the community knows about what he did. He posted it all over the news. And I believe, based on that, and based on the factors that I've already given your honor, that he is a danger to the community and he is a flight risk. And we believe that he should be held no bond and that nothing else will secure his presence for trial. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Yes, sir. Bye. And I'll keep it really brief. Thank you. With regards to the government's characterization that his act was in self surrender, I, I think that's laughable. I think that Mr. Medina presented himself to a police agency. Uh, within an hour of the incident and turned himself in for this crime. Our position is that with regards to the weight of the evidence, I think it's premature because we haven't been able to do our complete investigation while the government is still conducting their investigation. We haven't had the ability for our medical exam, our forensic pathologist, to review the autopsy. There's a substantial amount of things that need to be put up from the defense standpoint. But I will say this, Judge, for the government, this, for the government to make the allegation that Mr. Medina is going to be confrontational to anybody that approaches him, I don't think his past history excusing this incident substantiates that. There's no history or nothing to suggest that Derek, who everyone's 
claim that he's a jealous person and that him and the, the decedent in this case had a long history of being jealous. But if that's the case and he caught her looking at somebody else, there'd be a hint. And there was an altercation. We know that. And there's nothing. For the government to sit here and say, well, you know, hypothetically, hypothetically, there's nothing to support the allegation that Derek's going to confront somebody or have a violent confrontation other than this incident. Nothing in his past 30 years of living here in Dade County. Taking him into account, he's a security guard. He confronted the person that was abusing his grandma. I mean, let me tell you, I think that's a, I think that's a very substantial thing to know that Mr. Medina looked in the face of the person who was abusing his grandmother and decided to do things the right way. I think it's also important to, 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 to take into consideration afterwards when he went up to Isabella's room, he told her to stay there. And she didn't buy him right. She didn't go down and discover her, uh, her mother's body. She stayed in her room as he instructed her to do. He tried, he tried to keep her from having to see that confrontation, to see what took place. And it worked, because she didn't. If the government is so concerned about him having a confrontation, the court could require him to have 24 hour house arrest with the provision for coming to see his lawyers. If the government says the GPS doesn't work, that you can cut it off, I mean, that's ridiculous. That means the GPS, the court should never uh, issue a GPS in any case. Obviously, some people circumvent the rules. There's nothing to show in his past that he's one of those people. He can ask for the court to issue a bond, like I said, I believe there's a bond and conditions that the court can make that would reasonably assure that Mr. Medina will present himself to the court and we believe that he's not a threat, he's not a danger. Thank you.